Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome yet again to another inspiring edition of Inspirational Africans. Over the weeks, we've been bringing you many amazing stories that inspire you. Today, we have another distinguished guest who we are very privileged to host. Let us see who our guest is, whose story will wow you and indeed inspire you. In this edition of Inspirational Africans, we bring you the inspiring story of Dr. Ahineba Bwachi Ejei. Dr. Ahineba Bwachi Ejei is a Ghanaian specialist in kyphosis, scoliosis, spine reconstruction, and other spine-related diseases. He has for many years worked very hard to survive his childhood vision and desire of becoming a medical doctor and save lives of people, which has in today motivated his philanthropic and patriotic works. After obtaining his medical degrees in the USA, he also worked as assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Minnesota in 1987 to 1990. Clinical assistant professor, University of Southern California from 1990 to 1994, and assistant clinical professor, University of California, College of Medicine, Ivan, in 1993 to 1994. His clinical appointments included the position of associate medical director. In 1998, Dr. Bwachi Ajayi founded FOCUS, Foundation of Orthopedic and Complex Spine, as a way to provide orthopedic care, which includes treatment of the bones, joints, ligaments, tendons, and muscles to the people of Ghana. For eight years, Dr. Bwachi Ajayi provided this care by leading teams of volunteers from around the world four times per year to Ghana. During this time, Dr. Bwachi Ajayi also traveled to other parts of the world to treat adult pediatric patients and became a world-renowned specialist in complex spine deformities. Dr. Bwachi Ajayi and other donors have raised more than $20 million for focus. He and those assisting him have completed more than 1,900 complex spine and joint surgeries and they have treated more than 40,000 patients. Focus Orthopedic Hospital is also an important teaching facility for the education of local surgeons and caregivers. Dr. Bwachi Ajay's goal is to identify orthopedic neurosurgeons interested in pursuing the same specialty that he has and to train them. His efforts have inspired others to raise funds and volunteer towards his goal. Medical professionals have volunteered for many years with FOCUS and some have even moved to Ghana. As a founder and president of FOCUS, Foundation of Orthopedic and Complex Spine, he has helped provide orthopedic medical care to underserved populations in West Africa and other third world nations. In 2004, Dr. Bwachi Ajayi received a humanitarian award from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. He was also elected president of the Scoliosis Research Society for the 2008 and 2009 year and was featured in the Discovery Channel documentary, Surgery Saved My Life. He also won the Ahmedia Peace Prize in 2012. Please stay tuned and be inspired. Viewers, so we have him, Professor Emeritus Ohenaba Bwachiaje. Prof, welcome to Inspirational Africans. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, Prof, Thank our you. viewers just heard your story and what you do, very, very inspiring. I'm sure they were hearing some terms and I'd like you to explain to her. So you are a spine mm. reconstruction expert as well as an expert in kyphosis and scoliosis. For right. those of us who are ordinary people who might not be in tune with this legal jargon, can you just explain to us in a normal language what exactly you do? Well, honestly, um, I was just like them until I got to the okay. United States. Okay. That I was in the clinic once, and the doctor says, call you, so I says, what is it? And that was the first time I had heard the term. It's not a term that is used commonly in our medical uh, environment here. Uh, it's basically a cha cha, it's coliosis. Kyphosis is a curvature of the back, uh, which is like a hump back. Yeah, and um, it can be from genetic causes, uh, the scoliosis, and the kyphosis can be from uh, infections like tuberculosis. Okay. And what Tuber about tuberculosis can affect the spine, destroy the vertebra, and cause the spine to collapse. Okay. Then you see the hump on your back. If you're lucky and not get paralyzed, uh, you may live with a hump. Okay. Uh, and the, uh, the scoliosis can also come from neuromuscular conditions like poliomyelitis okay. uh, or cerebral palsy. Uh, or injury to the spinal cord, okay. 
whereby you lose control of your body uh, movements and the muscle function and then your spine just collapses under you. So when people come to you with these problems, with these spinal problems, what exactly do you do? Well, there are several methods of managing them and it depends on when they come to see us. Their age and the level of the, the magnitude of the deformity. Uh, the scoliosis usually is uh, worse when it's early in life, uh, like the first three or five years of life. That's the infantile type. Those are patients who, if they are not treated, will probably die early. Uh, they will probably get to 25% of their normal lifespan. If you develop scoliosis at a, as a teenager, you may have a normal lifespan, but you have a miserable life, you know, pain and difficulty breathing and all the other things that come with it. So it most un unfortunately, when they come to us, it's too late. Okay. That they cannot be treated with a brace. You can't treat scoliosis or spine deformity with medication or injection because it's a mechanical derangement. The spine has collapsed and it has twisted and it has changed its shape and then it affects its function. So most of these you have to do surgery and it's a surgical reconstruction, more like uh, human engineering. Okay. You have to reconstruct the spine, uh, straighten it up as much as you can safely because in the process you can paralyze the patient. You know, and uh, we have methods of avoiding that with special electrophysiological monitoring. So, so the surgery is very in involved, very intense, and it can be very expensive. So it's a very specialized area. Yes, it is. I, I think right now okay. I'm the only spine deformity surgeon in the whole country, okay. and maybe one of a few in West Africa. Okay. But I've, even globally, I've, you're not many, as it were. Well, right. I belong to the Scoliosis Research Society, which is uh, an international body of spine deformity surgeons which I was the president of 2009, and it has about 1,500 members all over the world. Uh, so it's, you're right, there's not many of, uh, of us that do spine deformity. Uh, there are neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons who do spine surgery, but really going into the specialty of spine deformity is uh, very, very uh, intense, and you need a lot of years of experience to really consider yourself an expert in spine deformity reconstruction. Tell us your transition between high school, secondary school and going to the state for, the, for your university education. Is it something that, at what point did you decide that you'd want, you wanted to go further your education abroad and how did you get that right, So when I, when I realized that I wanted to pursue medicine, I wanted to get the best, tra the best uh, uh, training and education and also to become a specialist. And in those days, uh, the number of students who attended the medical school in Ghana were not many. Okay. I was very competitive, and I'm sure that I could have made it if I really had set my mind okay. on uh, attending the medical I mean, school in Ghana. Uh, but I wanted to go abroad. For some reason, I, I just wanted to go abroad and, and, and study and pursue postgraduate training. So I managed to get to the United States with the help of uh, a family uh, member. Okay. And then I went there, worked for a couple of years before I even started college. Okay, so you didn't apply directly from high school in Ghana? You no. actually went, okay. Yes, I went there, worked for a while, and then applied into the colleges, got into the City University of New York, and then from there to Columbia University uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons. I know that education in the States is really expensive. How, how did you manage to go through all that? Well, I did so uh, with grants. Okay and loans okay. and work study. Okay. After your education, after you specialized, after you dissected all those cadavers and specialized in the spine, how did you start practice? Well, so after your uh, orthopedic training, okay. then you can either become a general orthopedic surgeon okay. or you can sub-specialize. I wanted to specialize in spine surgery. Okay. So then you have to do an extra year of fellowship. Okay. And that I did at the Minnesota, at the uh, Twin Cities Scoliosis Center, University of Minnesota, for one year. So that's where I actually got clinical training okay. in spinal deformity surgery. Okay. So from there, after that, I was appointed assistant professor okay. at the University of Minnesota with some, you know, four of the gurus of spine deformity surgery: okay. Bob Winter, David Bradford, Ogilvy, Mo. So I did, I was on staff for three extra years after my fellowship. So I built up a practice in general spine surgery, but I was also doing general orthopedics okay. because when you start out early, you just can't so specialize, okay. even if you have done a fellowship in a so specialty. So at the end of the third year, uh, we wanted to move out 
into a warmer climate. Okay. Minnesota is very cold. Okay. I don't know if you've been there, but yeah. it's very cold. So um, we went to California, okay. and there was an opportunity there to establish a spine center. Okay. So I was called to come in as an associate director okay. of the Southern California Complex Spine and Scoliosis Center in Whittier, California. So that was 1990. Okay. So I went there in private practice, uh, working with another two other associates. Okay. And then I was also an assistant professor at University of Southern California, uh, running the spine deformity program at Rancho Los Amigos Hospital. So I did that for four years, but interestingly, when I left New York Hospital for Special Surgery to go do my fellowship, the understanding was that after the fellowship, I would come back. back. But after the fellowship and the, the uh, consultants at the University of Minnesota, Bradford and uh, Winter, offered me the assistant professor position. It was an opportunity that I couldn't refuse because it was a way for me to build my experience for future practice because I couldn't learn from anyone more than Absolutely. those guys. So I called back special mm -hmm. surgery uh, chief. I said, I think I'm going to stay in New York. He wasn't too happy. I can imagine. You know, but I had to look out for myself too. But I knew that one day I would go back okay. there. So I stayed there for three years, and then went to California for three years, and then they called me and said, now you're ready to come? <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, okay. now I'm, I'm ready to come and take on the big boys. Okay. Because I think now I have had enough experience. So you went back to so you went to Minnesota, then came back to California. So I in started York. in New York, okay. went to Minnesota, went to California, California. then came back to New to York. New York. Okay. And I came back to New York as the chief of the scoliosis service. Wow. Well, I counted every move. By the okay. time we gone back to New York, we had moved like 17 times. Wow. How did your family you know, react, your wife and your well, kids? Well, my kids never went to the same school for more than three years. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I when went back and counted that. Daddy, well, just when we're making so friends, are it's like a diplomat. Well, they, they were able to make friends and, and, and let go of friends. But interestingly, they kept old friends along the way. I mean, Kwajo's friends are the people that he was in high school with, uh, same as Yao. But every three years, we were on the move somewhere. But once we came back to New York, we stayed from 94 to 2014. Mm -hmm. So that was so now let's years. come back to your reconnection back in Ghana. As you were, you know, growing up the ladder, developing yourself and getting, I mean, actualizing, at what point did you start thinking about coming back to Ghana to establish something? Or, or has it always been at the back of your mind? Well, always. I mean, I went to the U.S. to become an expert, okay. to earn enough money that I could build something later on. Okay. So it was part of the plan that I would eventually come back. But I wanted to make sure that when I came back, that I was not overqualified, that I could sustain whatever practice I brought along, okay. that it will help the community, that I can contribute to the de delivery of health care and also build capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, so all along I knew I wanted to come back. Mm -hmm. But in 1998, that's when I started to really plan towards the coming. Mm -hmm. And that is when I formed the foundation of Old Police and Complex Buy, a nonprofit organization which is registered in the state of New York that allowed me to uh, accept contributions from friends and colleagues and benefactors. Mm -hmm. Of course, started with my own seed money. Absolutely. And then I uh, started bringing volunteers back with me to Ghana to see patients and perform surgery. What? So I started my exploration in 1994. Okay. So 1998, I established focus. But four mm -hmm. years before that, I was coming back just to see the need. Okay. So I will come and spend two weeks, three weeks, okay. go to Kolibu, walk around, talk to doctors, okay. see what they were doing. And I only uh, came across a doctor, uh, what's his name? Corsa. Okay. He was the one spine deformity surgeon. Okay. Uh, but you know, he has retired, okay. uh, but there was no other beside him. Okay. So the old brick surgeons were probably doing spine deformity surgery, but really not to the level of expertise okay. even in those days. Okay. So I knew there was a big need okay. uh, and that I could contribute. So we started with seminars and community education programs. Okay. Uh, when we did lectures at the British Council, uh, the Tr Trust Hospital, uh, Kolibu Grand Rounds. What uh, were these lectures so, about? How to so these were basically to inform the public about spinal diseases in okay. general. Uh, from low back pain to spine deformities, and also to get the professionals involved to contribute so I know who is interested okay. in, uh, in being part of this. Mm -hmm. So for the four years I knew there was a need, I was able to uh, then create a protocol 
for patient evaluation and care and also surgical treatment. And you're also traveling across the world, you know. Oh, yeah, I was all over the place. And, and I had about 500 volunteers uh, come in over wow. the years, uh, including about 100 doctors. Okay. They came from maybe 12 countries. Okay. I had, uh, so as a consultant and professor of orthopedic surgery, uh, you had to be a professor in, in the United States okay. in an academic rank. Okay. You had to have an international uh, reputation, mm -hmm. which requires that you have published extensively, mm -hmm. you have traveled extensively, you have trained fellows. I have trained about 100 uh, spine surgeons all over the world, uh, excluding those who just will come and visit and get mm -hmm. one or two weeks of training. But for formal clinical uh, spine training, probably 100 uh, surgeons all over the world. Mm -hmm. And some still come here. You know, next month, one of them is coming from Greece. Mm -hmm. Uh, a few months ago, and one came from uh, uh, New Zealand. So I traveled all over the world. I taught. I also designed instrumentation for spine surgery. Wow. Uh, and I'm using instrumentation now that I designed that is used all over the world wow. by other I hope surgeons. You patented it. <laughs> uh, well, I have a patent. Okay. Yeah, I have so, a patent. So finally, you settled in Ghana. You established this really remarkable institution. Tell us yeah. more about it. So the goal was to eventually establish an infrastructure that would be sustainable. I mean, we came, we went to Kolibu, we did all the surgeries, but it really wasn't a home. Uh, we were, yeah. you know, graciously, you know, received very well and we did all our surgeries there, but we didn't have a place for our patients for follow-up. We didn't have a place for medical record keeping. And I'm very interested in outcomes research. And to be able to do good outcomes research, you need uh, a facility that will have good housing for medical records okay. and, and also for patients to come for follow-up. That wasn't the case. So we actually started in 2004 with the Watson House uh, Clinic, which is at East Legon. So a patient of mine gave us $100,000, so we bought a house in, in East Legon. The we patients convert, of yours in Ghana? In, in the U.S. In the, oh, okay. So we converted it into a clinic. Okay. So the Watson House Clinic is a place where our patients were able to come for clinical care and follow-up when they were, did the surgeries at Kolebu. But all along, I was raising funds to build this. Okay. And this was going to be something like $16 million or so $20 million. So I was able to raise funds. I talked, I talked to the government okay. that I needed seed money okay. so that I could go back for, to my benefactors and okay. donors. Because everywhere I went, they were asking, is the government helping? Okay. I know. So they had to do something. And okay. President Kufour was then in, you know, the head of state. Okay. So we got one and a half million dollars that I was able to use as seed money to raise the remaining $15 million, wow. all of which came from the United States and abroad. So from donor agencies from, yeah, and individuals? Individuals. A lot of them were my patients yeah. from New York. And in 2008, we broke ground. We acquired the land in 2008, uh, broke ground the same year. By 2012, we were done, and we opened the facilities uh, to uh, the community and for patient care and surgical treatment mm -hmm. in April 2012. How many people have you treated? I mean, in this facility, and I know in your lifetime you might have <laughs> touched so many lives. But how many people come in here? Are, they, are people aware of this facility? Uh, I'm told, you know, every time I come across someone and say, what is focus or where are you? You know, I've been on TV, I've been on radio, we've published extensively, we have a website, but still people seem, don't seem to know <laughs> where we are. So I hope these programs will, will, will expand okay. the, uh, will, will spread the news, you know, and expand the brand. Uh, but we have about 200 plus employees here. Wow. We see about five to 6,000 patients every year. Okay. And we operate- From across the sub-region? Yes, yes. And we do have, uh, we operate in about three to 400 patients every year who have complex orthopedic conditions. Yeah. Not simple stuff. Excuse me, we do joint replacement surgery. And the joint replacement surgery that is replacing arthritic hips and knees uh, very specialized uh, treatment that is managed by Dr. Ujedu, who is a sp fellowship trained mm -hmm. orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he does our joints. I run the spine deformity program. Mm -hmm. We have Dr. Akoto and uh, Dr. Yankee now, who are neurosurgeons who are also uh, learning the spine deformity uh, surgical uh, treatment protocols and principles. But they are neurosurgeons. So in Ghana, neurosurgeons are the ones who have done most of the spine work, okay. not orthopedics. So we have a residency program here 
uh, through the West Africa and the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. So occasionally we do get a resident who will rotate through okay. and uh, hopefully we will be able to identify orthopedic surgeons who are also interested in pursuing uh, spine deformity and joint replacement surgery as a career. So you're not only providing you know, medical help for people who need it, you're also training a new generation of specialists to take over the, the field. So, I mean, it's a remarkable story. When you look back at your life, you know, um, when you're a young boy, about six years old, hoping to be a doctor, going through the ranks, acquiring education, building a career, and helping to put this great institution in place, do you feel that you have fulfilled your mission in life? Well, I, I am very fortunate and I'm also grateful to the Lord Almighty that I've come this far. Uh, I've had a vision, I have a vision, and I've had a mission. I'm in the mission process now. Uh, but the vision really is uh, still yet to be attained. And that is to make this a sustainable uh, infrastructure and a program to build capacity so that uh, there will be more boaches when I'm not here. Uh, there will be people doing the work and continuing with the health care program that we have, we have started. So I'm pretty proud of our achievements. And when I say our, it's not just me. I mean, I've had a very supportive wife. Uh, we've been married for 42 years. What's her name? Uh, Hilda. Hilda. Uh, we've been married for 42 years. Uh, we, have, I have, we have three boys, uh, Kwajo, Kwame, and Yao, who have all been very supportive because uh, I've been away. Have any of them veered towards your area? Oh, no, one, they okay. are all in healthcare. Okay. Yeah, Kwajo is the director of research okay. in New York. Okay. Kwame is a surgical specialist. Okay. And Yao is an orthopedic surgeon himself. <laughs> yeah. He so, didn't give us one lawyer so or an engineer. As, or as, <laughs> as, as much as I okay. was gone, they were watching me, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, and they were following up. Because when I was home, we had fun. Yeah. You know, we would go on vacations, we would play ball, you know, and so you know, I've been very fortunate to have a very supportive family, okay. and also uh, by his grace I've been quite healthy uh, to continue with the work and not fall sick. And I was in, I have actually, after I was sick at the age of six, I didn't see a doctor till 40 years later. Wow. Wow. You know, I had my regular checkers back, knock on wood, I haven't been hospitalized, wow. and I'm 65. You've been awarded, rewarded, honored, I mean, I'm sure countless occasions. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Mission gave you the International Peace Award in the year 2012. Correct. Yes. Uh, uh, can you tell us about some of your most significant honors that you're probably very proud of? I'm sure you're proud of all of them. My best award is my family, of okay. course. <laughs> but besides that, uh, there have been several acknowledgments for the work that I have done. Uh, the first significant one actually came from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. It is a body of about 30,000 orthopedic surgeons in the United States and all over the world. And every year they pick one member to receive the humanitarian award. So that was a very prestigious award and I was humbly selected uh, to receive that award in 2004. Mm -hmm. Actually I was the fourth person uh, to receive that award uh, since its establishment four years earlier. And then also the Hospital for Special Surgery, where I was professor of orthopedic surgery, uh, Cornell University Medical School. They also select a member of the faculty uh, to uh, confer on them the humanitarian, not, not the humanitarian, but the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, so I received the Lifetime Achievement Award in 2013, but they thought I was retiring. <laughs> Hell, no way, <laughs> I haven't. Oh, wow. So that was 2013. And then the Doctor of Science Award from my alma mater, Brooklyn College, okay. uh, that was uh, a couple of years ago. Okay. And of course, the, uh, the Amedea Peace uh, okay. Award was chosen, given to me in London. Uh, so these are really my prize awards. We're coming to the end of the interview, right? unfortunately, but I mean, we can have such a, f a specialist like yourself without asking you, for those of us who are normal, just walking over, what, what are some of the few things you just give us to us to be very particular about taking good care of our health in terms of our bones, our spines. Is there any tidbits, just one or two, that at least we can also learn from your knowledge before we let you go? Well, you know, uh, it's very important to have physical health, but you also need spiritual health. Yes. Uh, and you know, I tell my children, and of course my family all the time, that I have three Fs. Okay. It's faith, family, and then friends, focus, and fun. Okay. So, so you got to combine all of that. Okay. Uh, and uh, you need to stay well, 
And I, I, I keep telling people, I've never had malaria. I say, you're joking. I say, no, I haven't. I don't know if the mosquitoes either don't hate me or my blood is not tasty. Mm -hmm. you know, but I, pre I presume it's luck. But it's also because that I make sure I dress well, cover myself, um, and I eat well and uh, read, write, exercise. Um, I don't go for jogging or running, but I do my walks, which is plenty, do my push-ups, my sit-ups, okay. and I uh, make sure I take my medication. I have high blood pressure, not, not significant, okay. but take a small dose of medication. And um, you, know, you keep your faith and you meditate, and you don't let things bother you. People are driven by tension and stress, and that can really, really even cause your immune system to reduce and fall sick. Okay, stress. Uh, try to stay calm. I mean, you cannot solve every problem. Well. You have to put your uh, <coughs> thinking hat cap together. Like this morning, I was troubleshooting on how to get a piece of equipment from the United States that we're having difficulty acquiring. But you know, you might get down from time to time, but you got to get up and move on. It's not the end of the road. Um, so motivation, inspiration, uh, commitment, and always recognize that you know there's a light at the end of the tunnel and the light is green. One thing you cannot do is waste time, because you cannot buy time. Once it passes, it's gone. So you have to take opportunity of every moment that you have. Manage your time well, uh, so that uh, you can be fruitful. You've just answered all the questions I had left. I was not to find about the role of faith in whatever you do and your advice to us, and I think that on behalf of MTA, we are very privileged to have had you. It's a very inspiring story. We also have very in, in, you know, good partners who have supported us, and I'll just tell you a few of them. Uh, the, you know, we've seen Ethiopian children around. Mm -hmm. we, have, we work with the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. They support at least 60 to 100 Ethiopians every year at a tune of about $15,000 apiece. We have African Surgery Incorporated, sponsored by this organization, which is in the U.S., and they support Sierra Leonean patients. And then we have Seas of Hope, that supports Zambian children. Uh, Upright Africa supports Congolese children. And then Stand Tall International Tanzanians. Uh, so those are international organizations that are sponsoring patients to come here to have uh, medical care. And but locally in Ghana, we have had sporadic support. You know, some have been the multimedia group of companies. Recently on Joy News and Joy TV, Jack and Joe School, uh, Vodafone has supported one patient. Uh, Compassion International supported one. Uh, TV Africa, TV3 actually supported the patient. And then the Right to Free, and then Street Children's Empowerment Foundation. So, I mean, these are sporadic, but right now I have on, the, on deck about 20 children, Ghanaians, who really need spine surgery that we can find sponsors for. You know, and their parents are not in a position to be able to come up with, say, $15,000. So I raise funds from the outside, but it's not enough. So we have a children's fund, uh, which we would love uh, listeners to really uh, look into and contribute. And by calling our hospital, you can get access or information on how to contribute. Or go on our website. Uh, there's a donate button that you can hit, and they will direct you to how to uh, contribute. So we we'll really appreciate getting additional support. Because it's very expensive to run this outfit. Prof, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure the almighty Allah is going to bless your effort and sustain this institution so others will receive the blessings from it. Prof, thank, thank you, you very us. much. Appreciate the opportunity to thank chat you. with you. So well, I guess uh, you've all been inspired by this very important interview. One man who has given a lot to this country and indeed to humanity. Thank you very much for joining us on another inspiring edition of Inspirational Africans. Watch out for our next episode. <laughs>